Can the political deadlock be broken in Spain? Spaniards vote for the second time in six months following failure to form a government. Will the outcome heal the political divide? And how are new political parties shaking up the system? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. Spaniards have gone to the polls to try to break six months of political deadlock, three days after the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union. The unprecedented repeat general election was caused by the failure of the four main political parties to agree on a coalition government since the previous election in December. It saw the breakup of Spain's traditional two-party political system into four. After months of negotiations, the People's Party of Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy could not persuade his rivals to form a ruling coalition government. With the UK voting to leave the EU, many Spaniards fear the uncertainty may worsen their own political climate. In addition to having no elected government, the Spanish are dealing with an unemployment rate of 20 percent, cuts in government spending and political corruption scandals. I think the results will be bad. I think Spain won't choose correctly, but well, we'll hope for a possibility. A good result would be that there's a change, an effective change, and a yes for change. But a change far from extreme positions and far from the populist actions and options such as those we've just seen in the United Kingdom. I hope the politicians reach an agreement. I think we'll have a government the day after the elections because they've promised this time more seriously and they have to reach an agreement. We cannot keep being without a government until December. Someone should give up the power for the rest to reach a majority. The conservative popular party and the center-left socialist party have traditionally led the government alternatively taking power. Two new upstart parties are now in the mix. Unidos Podemos, which means together we can in English. It was born from the anti-austerity movement. The new left-wing coalition is made up of the leftist party Podemos, as well as the communist party and others. The coalition wants to end austerity and the monarchy. Unidos Podemos is also promoting greater public participation in government, more private sector accountability, EU reforms, and a central European treasury. The second of the two upstart parties is the right-leaning Ciudadanos, or Citizens Party. It focuses on cleaning up government and fighting corruption. The citizens are against Catalan separatism and deeply committed to the EU. All right. Time to bring in our guests now in Madrid, Arnal Perez Valero, political analyst at the public affairs company Yorento y Cuenza. In London, Ramon Pacheco Pardo, senior lecturer in international relations at King's College London. And in Zaragoza, Zaragoza that is, via Skype, Pal Mari Close, assistant professor of sociology at the University of Zaragoza. And welcome to all of you gentlemen. Appreciate your time very much. Um, Ramon, I want to start with you. Is the two-party system effectively dead in Spain? I think it is. Uh, I think it has been uh, dead for a couple of years now. And I think the, the election is going to, to prove that there is a new party, which is Unidos Podemos, that you mentioned before, which is as big as the two other uh, main parties that we have in Spain, and that Ciudadanos is a viable fourth option. So I think the two-party system is gone for good in Spain. Pal, do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, basically, um, there is nothing more to say except for the fact that we don't know how it will uh, unravel in the future. Um, you know, on the one side, it seems that Unidos Podemos is going to be there for long because it gets uh, like a strong support from like young people. Um, and the citizen party might also be around uh, if the uh, two other parties, the, the PSOE and the Conservative Party, uh, basically remain weak if they get stronger results than expected, uh, the Citizens' Party uh, might be in a trouble because it stands in between two strong parties and that this is probably not the best position to be at uh, in the long run, at least. Arnal, do you agree that the, the two-party system is effectively dead? Well, we shall say this because in the future, 
we have to we have to consider that maybe one of two of these four parties may end up eating the other two. For example, in Unidos Podemos, who may now uh, do this surpass to the to the Socialist Party um, end up eating all the Socialist Party, and the same thing could happen with Ciudadanos and PP. So we don't know. We don't really know what's going to happen. So how far back do the signs go that indicate that this? this fracture was coming um, in the government. Ramon, if you can answer that for me. Well, I think uh, this goes back to, to the crisis. This is uh, quite clear, but it also goes uh, back to the issue that the, the government, the Zapatero government and then the Rajoy government have not been able to solve the crisis. The crisis started in 2008. Eight, nine years later, we are still discussing That's how to uh, put an end to it. It is a while ago, and, and I think this has been the major shock. In the mid-1990s, we have a crisis in Spain. The crisis lasted for two years, and then we saw a recovery. And this time, this hasn't been uh, the case. So, so I think this has been a failure of the two uh, main parties. We have also seen how at the local level, in, in Madrid, uh, in Barcelona, for example, these so-called uh, left-wing extremist parties actually have been able to govern, uh, for better or worse, but they have been able to do so. And I think this has uh, given them more credibility. Pal, um, I want you to weigh in on that as well. That th This has been years in the making. What are the signs that were, I don't know, ignored? Were people in denial? Well, to certain extent, the government was in denial because um, at, at the beginning, the Socialist Party, the Zapatero government between 2008 and 2011, denied the depth of the crisis. And in some way, uh, for a while, for two, three years, you know, basically didn't explain to the people how uh, Spain was confronting, you know, very difficult times, and these times required sacrifices. And these sacrifices were introduced at some point, like suddenly in 2010, when the Troika and uh, required, uh, requested Spain to do uh, something about about the, the deficit, the public deficits and the debt. And suddenly uh, the Spaniards confronted, you know, a reality they were not uh, told about before, or they were not strictly told what was going on. And so this affected like deeply to the credibility of the Socialist Party. And basically the Socialist Party has not recovered from them. And Podemos to, to a certain extent is the result of this lack of uh, um, capacity of the Socialist Party to explain what's, what was going on and to address like the vulnerable, uh, vulnerabilities of like the, uh, the, the, the most aggrieved uh, population during the crisis. So um, basically, especially among the young people who have suffered uh, the crisis in, 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 in the most extreme form. Um, Arnel, do you think that, that that had this situation, this crisis been managed better, that the people felt like they were being more responded to, perhaps this would not have happened? Or was this inevitable that more voices wanted to be heard? Maybe the crisis was in inevitable, but the, the response, the answer the political parties gave to this crisis was not was not mandatory. They could have chosen other options. So what they did obviously uh, conduct to the situation right now. So if they had opted for the other situations, like for example the ones in in Iceland, where they decided not to save the banks to judge the political class, maybe we would be facing a, a different situation right now. Ramon, what are your thoughts on that? Could, could there have been different tactics, different approaches taken over the last few years? I think this last point is is key. Uh, austerity was uh, presented as the only solution to the crisis, while other countries, Iceland was mentioned, uh, follow a different path. Uh, and I think in, in the case of Spain, where the crisis was very clearly related to, to a housing bubble and was uh, clearly related to the fact that the Spanish economy uh, wasn't as competitive as other economies, a change could have taken place. Uh, this change has not taken place. We have only implemented austerity, but the underlying economic causes uh, could, could, are, are still there and actually could lead to a crisis in the future. And I think uh, the electorate in Spain, they do realize that the two main political parties had run out of ideas. 
then came in uh, Podemos, uh, now Unidos Podemos, who at least proposed something different. Uh, and whether you agree or disagree with their policies, many people in Spain thought that we couldn't carry on uh, with the previous austerity policy. Uh, we see this in other countries in Europe, but I think Spain being now uh, well, the, the fifth largest uh, economy in Europe has been key because many other countries, smaller countries, have seen this as a viable option, uh, Unidos Podemos. And I think um, that if it comes to be part of the central government, uh, Unidos Podemos, this will lead other European countries to also embrace uh, these other possibilities. Um, I'm actually glad um, you brought that up because none of this is, is happening um, in a vacuum. There are similar things happening in other countries. Of course, the, the vote just happened with Britain. So let me lay out a few other parties, some other things that are happening. Britain's vote, um, in fact, to leave the European Union could fuel more fringe parties, both on the right and on the left, like um, the parties that we're talking about in Spain. So let's talk about what's happening in France, right? The Conservative National Front has been against the European Union. It called for reducing immigration, lower taxes, and less intervention in business. The right-wing Freedom Party in Austria has seen a big hike in its popularity recently. While it supports social welfare, it also believes in lower taxes and the privatization of public services. And the Danish People's Party has become the second largest party in Denmark. It is pushing to toughen immigration policies, uh, policies that is, such as the seizing of valuables belonging to refugees. And pal, I, I, those parties that I just laid out, there's a lot of common things there. How would you characterize the people that are gravitating to these parties? Well, uh, probably, uh, you know, behind all these uh, new parties that are emerging, uh, you see some grievances that are common, uh, grievances related to globalization, grievances related to the lack of protection, uh, you know, as the crisis uh, became uh, most, more severe. But you also see some difference that that need to be emphasized you know uh, uh, the reaction in spain has come from a, a populist leftist party which is uh, um, in broad terms unrelated to the parties that you mentioned in terms of you know the stance towards the refugee crisis for instance you know they have a very welcoming attitude towards uh, refugees and think that the european union should not be uh, adopting the tough policies they are adopting. Um, they might share some skepticism about the euro um, and about the architecture of the euro, but they are not against the European Union, uh, or at least, um, you know, not, not openly, because there is, there is um, significant suspicions about their true intentions if they got to power and they had, like, margin of maneuver to act as they they wish, uh, but in, apparently they are not against the euro. They are not against Europe. So so basically they are not sharing the same attitudes that you can see in UKIP, in in the Front National, or in the Freedom Party in Austria. Us, Arnel, uh, it sounds like what we're talking about are these are protest parties and, and protest party. They they are against something. Is it clear what they are for? I would, I would like to, share, to, to agree with, with the professor and moreover say that I think that maybe Unidos Podemos is not on the, on the right side, on the right wing, but they do share some points with the, those who defended the Brexit. Like, for example, they consider that the European Union is a fraud, a democratic fraud. They are all against the euro. They are all against austerity, against the, the policies that the European Union implemented through their member states. So, as he was saying, we don't really know what they really want, if they really want to abandon the European Union. But, like, for example, when Syriza came to power in Greece, they all had this, this uh, speech, but that, that finally they couldn't implement real, real changes in the policies they were doing. So I, we, we don't really know what's going to happen. So I think the better option is to face the problems, talk to the, the European Union, and confront them, not just exit the, the European Union. Ramon, is it that the establishment leaders are necessarily out of ideas, or are they 
just stubborn, for lack of a better word, and insist that the way that it has been done is the way that it should always be done? I think it's a combination of, of both of them. On the one hand, there's the, this idea that uh, liberalism, uh, economic liberalism is good, so we have to implement these policies to bring back uh, liberal economics, and many people we have seen, they don't support them. Uh, it is the case in Spain, we've seen those Podemos, Five Star Movement in Italy, and obviously UKIP here in, 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 in the UK. So, so in a sense, it's, it's a lack of ideas, but also a stubbornness. I mean, we keep implementing the same policies, these policies have not worked. Almost 10 years after the crisis has started, the Greece is still doing poorly, Spain is not doing well, Italy is only very, slightly, very slowly recovering. So, so in a sense, it is a combination of both. I would also like, like to say that I think right-wing, uh, left-wing parties, or some people call them extreme right-wing, extreme left-wing parties, they do share some, some issues in common. And we have seen how uh, in the UK, for example, Brexit was led by the working class. Uh, it wasn't led by uh, right-wing people. It was led by uh, people who normally would be called uh, left-wing. So in a sense, I think how these parties have more things in common than they care to uh, that they care to realize. Uh, and I think what they do have in common is, first of all, opposition to austerity. They want more public investment, and this is both left-wing uh, and right-wing parties. But also they want uh, control over migration. They, wa they want less liberalism, uh, so to speak. So I think it's not about left-wing, right-wing, but it's more about uh, economic liberalism, political liberalism, and those parties and people who are against uh, politics as usual. And, Pal, it seems that, um, to Ramon's point, that the parties on both extreme sides do have something in common. And it seems that at least one of the things they have in common is that they feel that they have not been listened to and that their leaders are completely um, out of touch with them. How did it get that bad? There was a, a widespread feeling that there was not really a response to some of the grievances that large segments of the population had, you know. Um, Spain had massive protests in, in uh, 2011 from basically young people, uh, you know, protesting against institutions that were not uh, providing a solution to the problems they had of lack of employment, of difficulties to uh, leave parental home, to, to, you know, to build a career, a professional career, to build a family and so on. And, you know, there was a a widespread sense that, you know, there was no response. And, and like the major cry at that point was, uh, they are not representing us. Um, you know, there was like this slogan, which was very shared within Spain about not being represented by the traditional parties. Um, at this, there has been an evolution from, the, uh, from then on, you know. Basically, um, all these parties share the idea that, you know, sovereignty needs to be recovered somehow. Yeah, that sovereignty cannot be uh, located in, somewhere in Brussels and, you know, be beyond, like, democratic accountability. Um, but uh, the, the, what emerged as a populist party in Spain, Unidos Podemos, uh, you know, has been making efforts to present themselves as moderates, okay? So at the very beginning, they had, like, very bold um, um, ideas about how to reshape, you know, the European Union, how to reshape Spain. And right now, you know, they are basically moving ahead uh, from that original position, and, you know, they are trying to present themselves as, like, the social democratic so, party. So, pa pal, are you saying that they're kind of basically, they're, they're evolving? Is that what you're saying? Well, you know, uh, it's not obvious if they are evolving or they are feigning that they are evolving. Okay. Uh, if, um, it's not obvious it, if it's real evolution or if it is only the position or the stance they want to present to the electorate it, so that they they increase the likelihood of being elected. Yeah, it may just be politics. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, Arnau, these parties, these anti-establishment... I, I think oh, that if we, considering the solution regarding the Brexit and all the democracy problem, if we want, this, if we want to prevent these parties from having this speech, from like taking back uh, competences from the European Union, retreating from the European Union, 
we must deepen our democracy in Europe. It's not acceptable for, like, for example, British citizens or for Spanish citizens, for French citizens, that European leaders, like the president of the European Council, is not elected. So they, we need accountability for our European leaders. It's not acceptable that we continue to implement policies, austerity policies, that are not approved by citizens, and we are not electing the politicians that are implementing them. Ramon, as these sentiments continue to, to, to gain more energy, um, it seems, what does this say about the future of the EU? Well, I think the, the future from, the, from a London perspective uh, is a bit bleak. Uh, I'm not saying that other countries are going to follow the UK and vote to leave the European Union, but I think it is quite clear that uh, in France, which is one of the founding members of the European Union, uh, the National Front is probably going to become the second largest uh, party uh, in the next elections. In Germany, we have uh, uh, parties actually that want uh, Germany to retreat upon itself and, and want less f fiscal transfers. Alternative for Germany, for example, has made clear that it is about Germany. It is not about the, uh, the European Union. Uh, in the Netherlands, Austria was mentioned before, in many rich European countries, there is uh, less support uh, for integration than there was before the crisis or even two, three years ago. And I think this relates to what was said before. There is this, this idea that the European Union is not democratic, there is a democratic deficit, we cannot vote for uh, European leaders, and this has to change. But the European Union uh, has been following the same path uh, since its foundation, so it is very difficult to change, and I don't think this is going to happen anytime soon. So I think the disconnect between citizens and the European Union is going to uh, keep on increasing. And at some point, either there is change uh, within the European Union or other countries, if the UK in five, six, seven years' time is doing well outside of the European Union, other countries might decide to follow suit, maybe hold a referendum, and detach themselves from the Union. Or now, is it enough to bring the traditional establishment government to a halt, which is what these parties are doing. If, if, how effective is that if your government can no longer function? What are you actually accomplishing that way? It depends on what level we are talking about. I mean, general business and general economy is going well if it doesn't depend on the government. If it does depend on the government and talking about European integration, not having a government is a big issue. So. Uh, concerning regarding the Spanish election, it is important that they agree on on some common basis and they start creating a government. So we step up this weird situation we are living now. Um, Ramon, who, who 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 is most likely to form a, an alliance, a coalition? How do you see that playing out? I know that. I know, right? That's the hard question. Yes. <laughs> It is, absolutely. But I think, uh, I mean, this was uh, said before, uh, it is necessary to have a government. The, the current situation cannot uh, keep on going. Uh, I think there are two issues here. It depends which left-wing party, the Socialist Party or Unidos Podemos, uh, comes on top of the other. Uh, if it is the Socialist Party that comes on top, uh, some in the Popular Party might think this is the lesser of two evils. Why don't we support uh, the, the Socialist Party? If Unidos Podemos comes on top, I think the Socialist Party cannot afford uh, to support them because this would spell, if not the end of the Socialist Party, a retreat uh, of, of this party from being the top left-wing party uh, in Spain as it has, it has been since 1978. Uh, so I think much will depend on the left. Now, uh, if the Popular Party, uh, together with Ciudadanos, is not far away from a majority and Mariano Rajoy decides to step down, this might mean that other parties will support uh, these two big parties. So, so in a sense, I think it depends on two factors. One of them, which left-wing party comes on top. If the Socialist Party is on top, there is a greater likelihood of a government. And also what happens with the popular party, whether it is willing to sacrifice uh, Mariano Rajoy as the next prime minister or not. We will have to see how all of this plays out. And gentlemen, um, thank you all for this um, really important discussion. Appreciate it. Arnau Perez Valero, Ramon Pacheco Pardo, and Pal Mari Close. Again, thank you. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website. That is aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That is facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also go to Twitter. Our uh, handle is AJ Inside Story.
from all the team here, I'm Michelle Carey. Thanks for joining us.